There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still In all of life's ebb and flow Good morning everybody, welcome to Yeovil Vineyard Church to our online service. I'm Karen, this is my husband John. Hello, welcome. If you're visiting us today then you are especially welcome and we really hope that you feel at home and comfortable with us this morning. So we're going to start our, our worship with about 20 minutes of singing so please feel free to, to join in or just sit back and listen to the music uh, and then we'll bring a talk on the topic of the day followed again by a worship song so you can just reflect on what's been said. At the end, please don't rush away. There's all the information that you need to connect with us. As I said, if you are visiting, please um, keep those details and we'd love to hear from you. Hello, Matt and Sarah here. Before we transition into a time of corporate worship, sung worship, Sarah's going to read a passage from scripture and I'm gonna pray for us. I'm going to be reading from um, the NIV and I'm going to be reading Psalm 105 verses 1 through to 4. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell all of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we seek your face in worship with open hearts, we invite you to manifest your presence among us. Come, Holy Spirit, work in and through us. Have your way. Amen. Amen. Your love is shining in the midst of the dark, the shining Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth, you now bring us shine. Gaze on. 
on your kingly brightness so our faces display your likeness ever changing from glory to glory mirrored here may our lives tell your story shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father
the end he claims I've heard upon this earth Speaks righteousness for me And stands in my defense Jesus, it's your blood Your cross testifies in grace Tells of the Father We approach not by earthly confidence, it's only by your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing. The blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God, nothing but your blood. Your blood, King Jesus. King Jesus. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims we've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for us and stands in our defense. And Jesus, it's your blood. your blood nothing but your blood King Jesus King Jesus King Jesus King Jesus
your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. We have been restored to the love of God. We thought it was the end, but it's just begun. We are sinners. for what we've done or for what we've not You are Jesus our strength and fortress our it was the end but it's just begun we are sinners saved by the grace of God not for what we for what we've not You are Jesus Our strength
Good morning, church. We are continuing our series on the book of Ephesians this week, and we are diving into chapter 4 this morning. In the first few weeks, we looked at the believer's wealth and privilege and position being in Christ. Now, for the next few chapters, we are going to be looking at Christ in us and us having a responsibility to live a changed life in the light of the blessing and privilege that we have received so freely from God. So I'm going to read Ephesians 4 verse 1. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It has meant so much to me over my life because this is what I have sought to do constantly, to live a life that is worthy of what Jesus has done for me and you know how he has given his life for me. So to live a life worthy of that is, is the only response, the only appropriate response that I could have. So what is this calling? It is God's invitation to embrace His salvation. You know, somebody preached the gospel and we received it with joy. Now, I know that there are many people that, uh, that don't feel this way, that feel that they are too broken or too sinful to ever be accept, accepted by God. Or you may feel like uh, having received uh, your salvation before, 
uh, you have messed up so much that God can no longer forgive you or have you back. Now, if that is you, in either case, I want you to hear this. God is bigger than your sin. In Romans 11.29, Paul says, For God's gifts and His call are irrevocable. So God's invitation to salvation is irrevocable. In other words, uh, whether you are turning God to God for the first time or returning to God, the door is always open. If you think about the story of the prodigal son, he messed up big time. And yet when he returned to the father, the father came running to embrace him and welcome him back. Uh, you may also recall that Jesus, uh, Jesus said that we are to forgive 70 times 7. The question to Jesus was, how many times am I to forgive my brother? And the guy said, 7 times? And Jesus says, no, 70 times 7. And it's not a particular number. That's 490 times that you need to forgive and then the 491st time, no more forgiveness. What he is saying is we need to keep on forgiving. Keep on forgiving. It is, that is the expectation that God has on us. Now, if God has the expectation that you ought to keep on forgiving those around you, then God also has the obligation to keep on forgiving you. You, you need to believe that your sin is never greater than God's ability to forgive because God is almighty and your sin is not. So Paul urges us to live a life that is worthy, a worthy response to God's invitation. Now, uh, a worthy response would be to live a changed life. And then Paul goes on to describe what this changed life looks like, and he also contrasts it with a sinful life versus a worthy life. So Paul describes the changed life as being marked by humility, by being completely humble and gentle. Secondly, it, it is a life that is marked by patience. He says we are to bear with one another in love. Uh, I remember a story uh, by, in, a, in a book by Mel Tari where he talks about this woman that just annoyed him all the time. And he prayed, by, he prayed about it and uh, God said to him, it's little green fruit. So the uh, the person's difficult behavior is normally little green fruit that hasn't matured yet. So, you know, oftentimes we, we get so upset and annoyed by people because they are actually immature. Their fruit, the fruit of their life has not yet matured. But on the other hand, we also have to guard against uh, those wolves in sheep's clothing. So on the one hand, we have to be patient and bear with those immature people with, with the little green fruit that are not very tasty and not very nice. And those people who are genuinely seeking to destroy and break up the church. And then there's uh, keeping unity. Another mark of a changed life is keeping unity through the bond of peace. And Paul goes on to explain that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father who is over all and through all and in all. And so unity is the, is the mark of the changed life. But God has also given gifts to the church, actually people with gifting that are gifted in order to 
equip his people. And we can read that Ephesians 4 verse 12 to 13. So God gave gifts to the church, people with giftings, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So remember that the goal is oneness in Christ. We are all meant to be on the same journey, one body, one direction, one vision, one goal, one purpose. But then there are wolves that come along the sheep and, and they make sheep noises to be accepted. And then they begin to cause division and try to separate people out from the church and, uh, you know, and bring destruction. So what I said last week is that sin separates and causes division, but the Spirit unifies and brings oneness. So this is how you will recognize a wolf in sheep's clothing. They are the ones that bring division and separation in the church. So Paul explains that as we start reaching for this goal of oneness, then... In Ephesians 4 verse 14 to 16, he says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So Paul again alludes to this uh, sheep in wolves clothing. And he says uh, they come along to try and control and manipulate and gain power for themselves. And the more mature the church become, the less likely we are to be led astray by the wolves. Instead uh, of the lies and the deception that they bring, we will speak the truth in love and grow to maturity as one body. So this is why in the vineyard we insist on adult-to-adult -adult relationships. We speak truth in love as an adult to an adult. We don't do parent to child relationships. That's for the immature and those who seek to control and manipulate others. Um, just as an example, you know, I am not someone's parent and they are not my child. We are all adults. We are all on this journey together. And so I come alongside and I speak truth in love. I don't approach other people as a parent wagging my finger at them and saying this is right and this is wrong. And I am not pleased with you or whatever the case may be. It's all down to adult to adult relationships because that's what mature people do. It is also why we insist on the Bible being the ultimate authority in faith and practice. The Bible is the truth, not a truth. It is the truth. We must adjust our lives and our behavior to fit in with the Bible rather than altering the Bible to, uh, to fit in with our culture. In Matthew 7 verse 16, it says, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So the bad fruit uh, are those that divide, that separate, that lead away, that break up the unity and the love and the fellowship within the church. And Paul then contrasts the worthy way of living with the unworthy way. And he commands us not to live like a Gentile anymore. 
So what does that mean? Do we have to become more Jewish? No. We have to become a new creation. Even a Jew must become a new creation, a new humanity, a new self. So I tell you this and insist on it in the law that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So in Paul's day, belonging to the church was a matter of life and death. People chose to follow Jesus, know, knew that they were putting their lives in mortal danger. But today's church is full of Gentiles who love the benefits of being in Christ, but hate the responsibility of having Christ in us. We read in verse 20 to 24, That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You may also remember how Paul speaks in Romans 12 verse 1 where he says that we have to be transformed by the renewal of our mind and that this renewal of the mind is our spiritual act of worship. So if we are in Christ, we're a new creation, a new humanity, a new self. The old one must die. But unfortunately, what we tend to do is we, we bury the old man and then at night we go back to the grave and we dig up the grave and, and, and lift up the body, the rotten, stinking body, and we try and give it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation so that we can keep it alive. The old man must die and the new man must live. So what does this new self look like? We've already uh, read that uh, we are to be humble, gentle, patient, uh, one with Christ and his body. So now Paul adds to this picture. And he says we are to be like God in righteousness and holiness. Wow, that is a tall order. Do you, do you know that to be a Christian or the word Christian means little Christ. We are meant to, to remind people when they look at us, they see Christ in us. We remind them of Christ. That is why we are called Christians. It is a very, very tall order. It is the call. We are to put off falsehood and speak only what is truth. In our anger, we should not sin and we should not let the sun go down on our anger. How many times have you encountered uh, people in church who, who let the sun go down on their anger, who struggle to forgive? They won't forgive and they won't forget. That is not the changed life. We are to stop stealing and do something useful with our hands so that we can serve others and help to build up the church. Uh, we are to speak only encouragement to build up the church, not unwholesome talk and gossip and all, all such stuff. And then we are, we are to not grieve the Holy Spirit, not make him sad or sorrowful, uh, or grieving or offending him. Ephesians 4 verse 31 to 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. 
be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Now I have to tell you that I see a lot of this in church. Church is the one place where you can't hide your heart forever. Remember the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to know and to make known. Sooner or later the old self will show up in church and people will see it. All that bitterness and the rage and the anger and the unforgiveness and the malice, they are to be put to death or they will keep on resurfacing like a buried tire. So this is precisely why we must be kind and compassionate and forgiving to one another. It basically works like this. Imagine I have a bag of rice and a teaspoon. And every time somebody comes to me that is in need, uh, I would uh, take my teaspoon and I would scoop out, say, two scoops of rice into their bowl. And then one day I am needy and I go to God and I say, Oh God, please help me. And God says, Yeah, sure. Just give me your teaspoon. And then he takes my teaspoon and he scoops two scoops of rice for me into my bowl. Leonie, on the other hand, she's got a spade. And so whenever you come to her and you say, um, oh, I'm in need, she says, oh, sure, I can help you. And she takes a spade and she scoops two spadefuls of rice into your bowl. And then one day, Leonie is needy and she goes to God. And God says, yeah, sure, I can help you. Give me your spade. And he takes the spade and he scoops two spadefuls of rice into her bowl. And you can see that generosity and forgiveness and kindness and being for people benefits you as much as it benefits others. In fact, in Luke 6 verse 38, it says, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now I want to give you three simple tasks that will ensure that you live a life that is worthy of the calling you have received. The first is, be outrageously generous, especially with your forgiveness. You know, bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment, they don't hurt the other person. It hurts you because you are carrying it around and it prevents you from receiving forgiveness. Forgiveness sets you free. It doesn't set the other person free. God still holds them accountable for what they have done, but it sets you free. Secondly, be outrageously encouraging. Have you ever felt encouragement by somebody? How does that make you feel? Paul spent a great deal uh, of time encouraging us to speak only what is encouraging and uplifting because that is what builds up the church into oneness and maturity. So be outrageously encouraging. And then thirdly, be outrageously unifying. So don't keep on looking for what separates and what divides and what we don't agree with or what exclu excludes but seek ways to include others, to include God in what we are doing. Uh, become a peacemaker. Stop being offended by everything. Instead, work together for the common good of this body, the church. Being an outrageously generous, encouraging and unifying person will transform your life and the life of everyone around you. Let's pray.
Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would come now and just bring your truth and your revelation into our lives. For everyone who, who is listening this morning, Lord, I just pray where they are at that you will meet them now. Whether they are listening to this message late at night or early in the morning. Come, Holy Spirit, and touch everyone now where they are. I pray, Lord, for strength in their inmost beings to grasp how deep and how wide and how great and awesome your good and perfect love is. And Lord, I pray that you would just encourage and strengthen us to have understanding and vision for the church to become mature in every way so that we may be filled to the measure of all of your fullness. Holy Spirit, above everything, I pray that you would continue to know Christ and to make Him known in us, in and through us, to know Jesus and to make Him known. The goal and the purpose of the universe. Come Holy Spirit and show us Jesus. Here is a love best as the ocean Loving kindness as the fly When the print of life for ransom Shed for us his precious blood Who is love will not remember Who can cease to sing his praise He can Forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy, flowed a vast in gracious tide grace and love like mighty rivers poured in sin from above and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love let me by love accepting, love the ever all my day, and let me seek thy kingdom only, and my life be to thy praise. Thou alone shalt be my glory, nothing in the world I see. Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me. Thou thyself hast set me free. In thy truth thou dost direct me by thy spirit through thy word. In thy grace my need is meeting. As I trust in thee, my Lord, of thy fullness thou art pouring, thy great love and power on me, without measure, full and boundless, drawing out my heart to thee, who is love. can cease to sing his praise he 
can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal day. Tongue or pin could ever tell. 